everybody, this is Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. Tonight we have a great sci-fi event in store for you. And I am very excited because we get to celebrate the book birthday! And the <laughs> book in question that you may be asking, which is the important part, is Threader Origins. And it is Gerald Brandt's. It's the first book in a new series, so I'll let him tell you a little bit more about it. But um, Gerald is also the author of the Cyberpunk San Angeles Sci-Fi Trilogy, and he is going to be in conversation with another name. Both of these are names that you guys know, because I know a lot of people love both of you at our store. But Gerald is joined by Jason Huff, which I am saying correctly this time after verifying, and he is also <laughs> the New York Times bestselling author of Zero World and the Dire Earth Cycle. Before I pass it off to them, this is the Vanna White section, if you will. As many of you have noticed, there is the comment section to the right-hand side of the screen. But the best part of the events is that you get to ask questions. You have the authors at your mercy, so make sure you take advantage of that. And right down below where it says, ask a question, as it would imply, if you click that button, that is where you can ask a question. And also, what better way to celebrate a book's birthday than to purchase it? So if you would wish to purchase this book, there is going to be a buy book and personalized book plate button down below. I am going to go ahead and pass it off to you, Jason, and have a great event. I will see you guys at the end of it. Sounds good. Sounds Thanks. Good. All right. Thanks. That gets me out of having to do the intro, too. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, congrats on the book launch. Um, this is always Thank a... You. Uh, you and I have both done this a few times now, and I think it never really gets old. Um, there's always something special about the day the book comes out, but there's also always something weird about it. I don't know if you've experienced this, but um, I always find that by the time a book is actually, like you've written the manuscript ages ago, and then it goes off for, you know, your editor looks at it, and then you might get it back and make a bunch of changes, or who knows, um, but then you have like copy edits that happen later and final proofreading and all that. But by the time it's actually like, in readers' hands, I, it's been all over the place for me, but usually it's at least six months, if not longer, in the past for me in terms of my writing. And I'm so like into whatever I'm currently working on that it's it's sometimes really hard to make that switch and go back and talk about something that came up before. So really, I want to get right out of the bat. Like, what are you working on currently? Just a quick, if you can say, um, and then we'll just totally go threader after that. But. Uh, I, I thought I'd right. give you that opportunity right away because I'm always like, God, what I'm working on right now is the interesting thing. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Threader Origins, I handed in a long time ago. <laughs> over a long time ago. But well, I, and things are taking longer right now, years. too. Yeah. 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 Um, and in the meantime, I have written the second book and it's already in. And we're Excellent. just going through some final revisions on that. And I am currently working on uh, book number three which is sadly a little overdue at this point. And is it a trilogy or is it going to it's a continue on? It's a trilogy. At least a Darwin's story. Uh, Darwin's yep. my main character. Yep. His story is a trilogy. There's certainly more stories in the Oh, world, yeah, of course. But, yeah, uh, yeah. but his story is, will be done at the end of the trilogy. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, so, I mean, the book is awesome. Uh, I, I read it several months ago now, and I, I popped in the audio book this morning just to kind of refresh my memory because I've been um, I've been reading for a, um, a book award this year and I can't say anything more about that but the point is that I'm reading like way more books than I'm, I usually do because I usually like to kind of really savor them and get into them so anyway I wanted to refresh my memory <laughs> and the thing that I um, I mean I love the book uh, but the thing that I was just uh, having a great time with um, and I just thought I'd mention this to see if it was something that you uh, did on you know consciously or whatever, but um, you have the best descriptions of headaches. <laughs> uh, I just love them. I, I think I remember one. And I'm, I might be paraphrasing a bit, and this isn't really a spoiler for anyone, but it, uh, I think you said it. I I felt like a pickup truck had driven into my brain and started doing donuts, <laughs> and I thought that was just <laughs> that's so great. Uh, as someone who gets migraines, uh, you know, fairly often, um, I, I really love that. Um, but generally, I get from the book itself. I think I don't like. Um, I'm, I'm very anti-spoiler, so I'll kind of leave it to you how much you want to actually say, if you want to talk about you know the the setup or the premise or anything like that. But the only thing I would say is that I get a really good like Connie Willis vibe from it. It's got that kind of 
sort of mood and um, pace and characters and the world building is, you know, exemplary. And I just loved it. So um, what, what would you like to say about it to people? Um, or do you like it when people can go in um, with as little sort of upfront knowledge as possible? Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't mind telling the premise of the, of the story. Um, uh, but again, I'm like you, I don't want to give away too many details. But if somebody asks the right question, I'll tell them the ending. <laughs> it's always tough when they ask me to do or at least review the the back of the book copy because i no matter what it says i'm always like this gives away way too much why are you telling them all this oh, I, so yeah it's actually one of the parts I, I really don't like doing is when i get asked to write the the, the copy it just uh yeah it, i struggle every time but it, the, the premise of the of threader origins is um um uh uh Again, it's just now three books ago, so I'm struggling, and I even read it this morning so that I could make sure that I could answer this properly. <laughs> um, uh, Darwin Lloyd is, is the main character, and he's, um, he's a student uh, in the university. He's a physics student, and he has a, a summer job helping his father build uh, a quantum-based machine that uh, is basically a power source. It can, you can hook it up to the power grid, and it'll just power everything at relatively no cost. Um, and he is there for uh, for the final full power test, and things go um, things go really really wrong, and Darwin gets pulled into an alternate Earth, uh, in the same time frame, but where the exact same experiment that just pulled him across actually happened five years previous. So there's been so changes to the to the alternate Earth that uh, that he has to deal with and learn how to live with, and struggle to try to get back home. Yeah, I really enjoyed um, how different that was when he when he makes that first crossing, and um, it's just such a different scenario going on. Uh, so uh, the world building in general was fantastic, and um, thank you. It's, it's great to see you kind of explore all that, and and I really really enjoyed it. Um, the, the idea itself, like, what was the genesis of it, or how long ago did you have it, and was it something that you had to sort of I don't know if this has happened to you, but I, I, I have ideas all the time that I have to kind of park while I'm working on whatever it is I'm supposed to be working on. And it can be really hard when yeah. you've got, you know, something that you're just really excited about, um, but you know it's going to yeah. be a while before you can get to it. This idea I had a long, long time ago. I had a rough idea a long time ago. I, I had uh, Darwin, the main character, um, developed, but the actual world and how things worked were just kind of floating around. They weren't. They weren't solidified. Yeah. And um, when when Daw Books bought um, the Courier, the first book in the San Andrews series, they hadn't yet agreed to buying books two and three, which I hadn't written at that point. So yeah. rather than writing book two, a book I, I wasn't sure I had sold, that is when I wrote um, Threader Origins. So oh, okay. The first draft I think would have been 2013, 2014, yeah, somewhere in that say way that. for yeah. the first draft. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, so. Yeah. Huh. yeah. So I, I almost always start out with a character first. I, the, somehow this, this character just pops into my head. And then from there, it's just working to, to put him or her into a world that's just going to stress them out so much that they hit the breaking point and become new people. Yeah. 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 Now, um, again, trying not to get into any spoilers, but the this device you talked about and, and what it can do and the threads in general, did you sort of... Um, come up with the sort of rules for how all that works to serve the story or was it the other way around or a mix? Like how do you, it's in, in a lot of ways it's similar, I think to when a, when a fantasy author is doing a magic system and sometimes they have the idea for the magic system and then they build a story that, that can, you know, make great use of that. And other times it's, they've just got this great story idea and they want magic in there and they'll, they'll build a rule set sort of that, you know, right. Support that. Um, these, these rules, I, I knew I had to have them, uh, yeah. For sure, um, but they grew organically as I wrote. Oh, cool! Um, and then in in the revision process, I solidified them so that they were actually consistent all the way through. And I actually wrote Threader Origins as a fantasy at first. Oh, did you really? Why, oh, now that's interesting. Yeah, which is why the the threads have a magical feel to them. Yeah, but, uh, uh, yeah. It turned into a science fiction novel, which I think is uh, significant. Well, the lines are often blurred, going. but I think that's really cool to know. I mean, because it it. You know, from from the rules of how that worked, and also the world building in general, it, it kind of gave me that vibe in, in a lot of ways. So um, that's a, that's a really cool little detail there. 
Uh, wow. So, well, um, I think somebody had asked in the questions, but I, I always want to ask this because obviously being an author myself, it's something that we can kind of geek out on <laughs> together. But um, from a process standpoint, I'm curious if um, you've done, it's, this is your fourth book published. Is that correct? correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, ha has your process changed significantly since the first book or is it something that's always evolving? What, what, what do you, um, and especially now, maybe you can also, if you want to, in the context of being on lockdown and everything going on, I don't know if it's, that's also affected it. It certainly made it difficult for me to get anything done with the kids home all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My kids are growing up. So, it's, so that was out of the equation, but um, uh, has nice. the process changed? I'm going to have to say yes, um, for sure. Uh, the, the first book, uh, The Courier, um, was actually a NaNoWriMo novel, National Writing hey, no same National with my first novel book. Writing one. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that, that was a highly organic uh, process that took far too much to revise into something that actually made sense. <laughs> so <laughs> that's when I decided that, that uh, I needed a process. And you know, honestly, if we get into, into process, and I think that's actually the first question on there, Right. Yeah. I could talk about it and it would take an hour. Yeah, I know. It's, more, right. It's, uh, but and I know I, there's I always some things. readers who are just like, ah, stop telling me about that. I just want to know about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> but I plot things now. I, I, I've got a, a whiteboard here that has, uh, that is just absolutely filled with post it notes that I yeah. then move into a spreadsheet. And then I, and it's all color coded and the spreadsheet gets all the details. Then the spreadsheet, uh, the critical lines get moved to the document. And then I start filling in the details a scene at a time always sequentially, never out of order. Nice. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I personally I bounced have... around. So yeah, it's, it's, um, I think I'm still trying to find what people would call a process, but I mean, we all have a process, but I think I'm always sort of chasing right. The, the right way to do things. Yeah. Yeah. I can uh, put a, a link in, if anybody's interested, I'll put a link in the uh, chat window. I, I wrote a guest blog on my process. Yeah. So yeah. I'll throw that up there. I'll read it. Yeah. Um, and by the way, for everyone watching or listening, um, there is a little ask a question button at the bottom, sort of near the, where you type in chat. Um, so feel free to put questions there and um, we'll, we'll get to them pretty quickly, I think. Um, I wanted to keep this casual. Um, you and I can talk as long as, as we feel like, but, um, but I'd, I'd rather people get to ask their questions. So. Um, so in terms of like lockdown and all that, I mean, is that, affected any of your process or how you think about writing? Um, um, I, I think the lockdown and the whole, well, the, the whole, you know, the whole pandemic and the whole political situation um, south of the border, since I'm Canadian, um, <laughs> it's all kind of affected my psyche. And I've, it's, it's been a struggle. Yeah. It's been yeah. a struggle to write, which is why book three is late. Uh, in theory, book three should have been handed in before Threader Origins even came out. And oh, okay. it's not, so it uh, it's going to be. I'll be handing it in probably uh, uh, in June now. So yeah, it's a, it's been a struggle it, uh, to to actually sit down and concentrate and write and and because of the pandemic, I, I have a, a job as well, a full time job, and uh, all of my all of the staff moved to uh, working from home, and since I'm sure. the IT guy, I had to do all that work, and so it, it, oh it's yeah, been, yeah 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 struggle yeah yeah. Um, what about your, um, just a slightly off topic, I guess, but, but also not, um, in terms of what you're reading or, or watching has, what are you reading and watching these days? And is that also something that's been affected by everything going on? Cause I find I'm very into comedy all of a sudden and just much lighter <laughs> stuff. I just, I just need things that are cheerful and, and I don't have to think a lot about or, um, whatever. And it's, it's been one of the challenges for me uh, reading for this book award I'm reading for um, because uh, my, my taste in what I want to read personally, I've have sort of grown quite a bit uh, in, in recent months. So I'm just right. curious um, on your side. Yeah. Re reading kind of drops off when I'm in the middle of a book. So, and yeah. again, you know, because I was supposed to have been in the middle of the book, I never actually picked up anything really that I could dive in to read. Um, yeah. Last one I did was, uh, was Troy uh, Carol Butcher's uh, book. I can't remember the title off the top of my head right now. Now but, is uh, the, is I the reading dropping one. off a, a, a time constraint issue or that you don't want what you're reading to influence what you're writing or something like that? I don't want what I'm reading to influence my writing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah fair yeah, enough. That's, that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, 
this is this is embarrassing, but I'm in trouble. Um, I I ate a meal that has somehow affected me. <laughs> yeah, right. really. I don't bad. mean to laugh at you, um, but you know. No, uh, but go um, go do your what you need to do. We'll take a quick break. And, uh, I, I sincerely apologize to everybody. I, I probably <laughs> uh, this is horrible. Uh, excuse me, please. <laughs> no problem. Uh, he wasn't verbal before. That's great. Um, uh, I, I, I maybe you can tell a quick story while he's gone that. Um, the first book event that I did when I moved up here to Seattle was actually the day we moved here. And I was sitting there and started talking, and then all of a sudden, I got this horrible bloody nose just out of nowhere. Like one of those ones where it's like, and so I had to just say, I'll be right back, and I like ran to the bathroom, and it just would not stop. And I was in there for like 10 minutes, and everyone was just sitting around waiting. It was really weird. Embarrassing. I know how I was feeling. Was it because of, like, the high altitude, or you weren't... Honestly, I think it was a mix of so many things, because we drove from San Diego up here to Seattle during the summer. And I usually... That usually happens to me when I go through, like, a a, a big change in weather very quickly. So, like, if I go to a conference in Phoenix, I can almost guarantee you I'll get a bloody nose the first time there. Whether it's just because it's so dry or just the weather changes. And we've all been there. Yeah. I've definitely yeah. had moments where I have been like, pause, smile, excuse me while I run away. I shall return. <laughs> yeah, it is tough when you do these events. And I, it makes me admire um, like people who are on TV every day or something like that, where they have to just always be on. And it doesn't matter if you're not feeling good. or you know, I've done panels at conferences where I've had migraines and things like that. And it's terrible. And it's terrible. Because everyone, everyone wants you to be, you know, your bright, cheerful self. Bright, cheerful self. <laughs> yep, you, they always want you to be the 100% best version of yourself. And right. And you're all right. human. That is very oh, challenging. Very <laughs> but I have a great appreciation for broadcasters. And broadcasters too. I like, a, I like a, is that Josie? Am I saying that right? Anyway, the comment about nosebleeding meaning something else. I, I am a little bit aware of that, not in the example you gave necessarily, but in, um, in a lot of anime, it's um, a signal that somebody is embarrassed or in love or something like that, like a romantic type situation. So. They are, you're being so nice about how you're describing that and how they use it in anime that I am not going to say anything else. And on that love Fair enough. note... Fair enough. <laughs> He's back. He's back. I, don't know I told my, story. My, story. my my book signing nosebleed book story nosebleed to kind of cover up your. I had my headphones on, so I heard you. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> At least you didn't leave it transmitting. <laughs> no, no, I have a separate microphone in the office. So oh, there, you <laughs> there you go. Smart man. All right. Well, you're back. Um, we were talking about what we're consuming media wise these days and, and how that's right. changed. Um, which always makes me wonder, of course, if that's a broader thing as well. And, you know, that's something almost probably for our agent to answer. But our agent, by the way, is in the chat here, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Um, in terms of what people are, you know, I don't I don't really pay too much attention, honestly, to like what's hot or whatever. But I, I, I'm guessing that you can probably notice some trends and things changing in terms of what people are into now. Yeah, you know, I, I don't really stay on top of that too much either, but um, uh, I recently watched uh, The Queen's Gambit on Netflix. Oh, I've heard great things about that, yeah. Just fantastic, yeah. Highly yeah. recommended. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and great. my TV consumption has gone up this year as well. In, you know, in yeah. comparison with my reading going down, my TV consumption has gone up because I can just veg and eat potato chips and get fat. So, yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been binging on British comedy for about six months straight and I'm not complaining. Um, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> having, <yeah. laughs> um, well, that's cool. Uh, so we've got like seven questions here um, and we're about 20 minutes in. I'm wondering if we want to start peeking through these. And sure. um, so someone says here, um, you mentioned writing a scene at a time. Does the story play out in your head like a movie script? when I read Courier Trilogy, I could almost see this movie in my mind. Um, yeah, that's a great question. That is a great question. Um, and I'm, for me, it, it doesn't work that way. I, I, ne I, I very rarely visualize um, the scenes as I'm going along. And it, it shows in my first, second, and third drafts that the description is, 
is thin and tinny and, and full of holes. I actually have a revision pass where I, I, I specifically just look at the details so that I can build the world into a stronger, more visual thing because it, it, I think it's one of my weak points, uh, especially in the first and second drafts. Yeah, sure, sure. It's almost like you um, you need some sort of choreography skill a lot of times, especially with books that have a lot of action in them like ours do. Um, you know, a, a stunt coordinator might have a better time uh, <laughs> writing some of these uh, scenes than than I do because I, I find in a first draft, especially like you said, you you know you have somebody doing something with a hand that would never be on that side because they you had them turning that way, and and when you read yeah. it and actually visualize it, you're like, oh gosh, that would never work. Why did I say that? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that is and a good thing, me, I think, to not worry no, about when you're writing a first draft. And then, as you said, you kind of revise it in. Um, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. 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 And, and because of that, my first drafts are usually seventy to 75,000 words. I'm not one of the writers that, that will write a 200,000 word first draft and then have to prune it okay. down to 100,000 words to fit a novel. I, I, I layer it and build it up. Lean, as I lean, and then beef it up. Okay. And yeah. I don't even... Um, what is something like a uh, threader at word count wise in its published form? This is more for your I think than you know, it's under date. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's great. Okay. All right. Well, I hope uh, that answers your question. Um, feel free to tack onto that if you need to. Let me go down to the next one here. Um, Gerald, share how you share your virtual. Oh, this is the process question that I think that we sort of started with. Um, but it talks right, about, Ken. um, yeah, yeah. Ken's there. Um, um, he basically just wants to know how you exactly how you do what you do so that he can reproduce it. I assume. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. yeah. But again, I put the link in the chat so that they can find it there. For, yeah, that's uh, great. Uh, um, yeah. I always find those things fascinating, um, especially since there's just there's no right or wrong way to do it. There's just everyone, you know, whatever it takes everyone, to get the words down and get them into publishable form. Yeah, that's always the main thread is uh, um, writing the actual words. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. Do you do any um, anything to kind of keep yourself motivated, or are you kind of? I, I'm in a little. Um, it's not really a, a reading critique or anything like that. It's just a little group with two other authors where we just kind of daily just check in. Is anyone working? What are you working on? What's your goal today? How many words or whatever? And yeah. we just you know kind of encourage each other, I guess. I, I do have a group like that, uh, and we actually used to meet once a week. Uh, we would yeah. pick a restaurant and we'd take over a corner of the restaurant. And we'd actually stay there for three, four hours, and we chat a little yeah. bit, eat, and we would write as, as well. Um, That's great. Unfortunately, that, that dissipated um, with the whole COVID thing. Yep. Um, so That we, was always my solution. If I, if, I was ever, if I was ever stagnating at home, writing-wise, I would just pack up my laptop and go find a restaurant or coffee shop or something, and something about yeah. the change of scenery would often get things moving again. Um, but yeah. yeah, it's been, which we can't, can't do, do now. So, uh, what I've, what I've started doing now for, for this third book is the same thing that helped me get the courier done, um, in, in a one month. And that is I set my alarm for five in the morning and I oh, wake go. up, I sit down and I don't have a coffee. I don't do anything. I sit down and I write for two hours. So I write from about, you know, 10 after five to seven o'clock in the morning and to get as many words in as I can. And that, that seems to be working again for me. I did it That's before great. because I had very young kids and they would wake up at seven. That's, and I, I mean, it's funny. Parent. We have such a similar, we have a similar backstory. <laughs> the whole, uh, yeah, doing national novel writing month on my first book. And yeah, the only way I could get it done was to wake up super early and yeah. go right before work. Um, and then with the kids and everything. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's really tough. Um, all right, let me keep going here. Um, are we, I think we talked about when did, or did you have this idea when you were writing San Angeles, and it sounds like it. Did it come before? Did you actually have the idea for Threader before the no. uh, the Courier? Or okay, uh, certainly certainly before the Courier was published, but not before I'd actually written the first draft of Courier. Yeah. Okay, everything's and kind how of hard mingled, was it to, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and and uh, I guess maybe to just follow on to my own question from earlier about um, it wasn't even really a question. It was something you were talking about when you when you have an idea for something while you're in the middle of working on something else. Um, I, I, I think it's like critical to capture those somehow so that you can almost get it all out of your head and onto a note card or post it or something. Do you, what, do you have a system for sort of capturing ideas and 
does it allow you to park um, them or do you, is it impossible to get out of your head? I, I, I try to jot them down, but uh, usually they come at uh, two or three in the morning and, uh, and <laughs> I read my scribblings the next day and, and uh, they kind of look like yeah. uh, a doctor's signature. So it's <laughs> can't, can't read them, but uh, I, I actually I've had tried a great that idea for, Go ahead. Yeah, it doesn't work. I had a great idea and, and in order to keep it this time around, I actually sent my idea to Sarah. Uh, our agent, and, uh, yes. and so it's now it's in her head, and I don't have to remember it. <laughs> She'll remind me. <laughs> yeah, I like to tell her my working title for something that I, it's still in the idea phase, just so she because she puts it in her little log, and we'll keep saying, "By the way, what's the status on this?" And I'll be like, "Oh my gosh, yeah. I don't even know what that is yet. I better make something up." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, actually, Threader Origins and and uh, the next two, Threader War and Threader Gods. Um, it's the first time that my working title was not accepted as the title of the final product. Ah, so it was a okay. new experience for me. And uh, it, uh, uh, me and my editor, uh, Sheila Gilbert at DAW, two-time Hugo yep. award-winning editor, um, uh, just we sat on the phone for, for an hour and a bit and, and uh, chatted yep. and brainstormed and then went through email and came up with, uh, with, the, with the title of the books. And then she just threw it at me and said, you figure out the series title and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I think only my first book I, was my title. And then everyone after that has been kind of a workshop thing. Um, but you also mentioned, I'll ask you this, um, that the current one is a little late. Is that the yeah. first time you've been late turning something in? Because I've recently experienced that for the first time, and it's weird. I um, would like to say no, but um, <laughs> I... I I promised myself that the very first time I actually asked for an extension, I promised myself I would never, ever, ever ask for an extension again. It just, mm. it, 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 it felt horrible to me. It made me feel like, like, like scum, like I wasn't a writer. It, it was just horrible. Um, and that was for book three of the last series. Okay. And uh, book three of this series has done the same thing. Um, yeah. This time I'm blaming external forces rather than, uh, than, than internal forces. What happened yeah. with the first series was um, I wrote um, The Courier, and then, I, like I said, I didn't have a contract for the next two books, so I wrote Threader Origins. Um, and then I got the contract for the for books two and three, and my delivery on book two was six months. So yeah. I wrote book two uh, from nothing to, to finish in six months, and I, had, I think I suffered burnout, and that made book three late. So okay. that was my own darn fault. Yeah. In this case, I don't think it's it's entirely my fault. I will take responsibility for it, but but yeah, it was uh, yeah. And Sarah just uh, asked if it was originally called yeah. Threader Origins was originally called Cabal. Oh, okay. B A L. That was the working title. I yeah. still think that's good, but I think Threader Origins is good too. So yeah, um, yeah. I think the problem with Cabal as a title was it 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 reflected. I can't say it. Darn it. No, I can't say it. that would be a spoiler. <laughs> So there's a problem with Cabal that that uh, I agree with not using it, but I can't tell you what it was. It's always weird to me when a when a book's title is a spoiler. Um, and I it, the title's not a spoiler. The reason why it's not a good title is the oh spoiler. okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, um, so you already mentioned that you, a second book is turned in. Someone asked if book yes. two was on the way. Um, so. Do, do we have a release date for that yet? Are they going to try to do them somewhat rapidly? or? I, or I don't it... know. I don't have a release date for two. And okay. uh, I think it, it really needs one more um, pass by uh, by Sheila and myself before it's it's something that I think is ready to go. Okay. Um, usually uh, Sheila and I will do uh, two passes. It's, it's been, yeah, I think two passes is the average of what we've done on a book before we yeah. figure it's ready. So And the second one hasn't happened. Okay. Not yet. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Um, when reading, I found Darwin's relationship with his dad complicated. I think that's a great uh, reaction. Um, complex, multi-layered, I would say. Um, certainly well-developed to me. But um, can you speak to that in terms of character development? This is from Sarah Megabo. Uh, that is our agent. Uh, always the tough questions. You know, yeah. I winged it off the top of my head. I don't know what I did. No, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> again, that was, that was one that, um, um, 
th that relationship actually uh, changed dramatically um, after the first pass of edits um, with Sheila Gilbert. Um, in in my my initial versions, um, uh, Darwin and his father were were actually quite antagonistic. Um, okay. They, uh, they they blamed each other for certain things, and and you know they um, his his dad had OCD still in my versions and stuff, and that that created. Yep hardships and stuff and and, and although it, it created great tension and, and it, it moved the plot forward it it, it kind of weakened darwin a, uh, a little bit okay sure so talking with sheila we actually made that relationship uh, a closer one um where they were you know they helped support each other and build each other up and i really think that going from that antagonistic to the working together one is what helped create um, the layers in that relationship. I, I think it really made it complex. Yeah. Yeah. I really liked Darwin's, um, at least, you know, at the beginning, he's, he's got that sort of socially awkward and kind of keeps things in. Um, and I also like, I mean, there's just little details that I just love. Like, um, you know, you, you have him where he had been an intern, maybe I think it was a couple weeks earlier, but now he was right. sort of already past that and didn't even have mm -hmm. his little, pass card anymore and they had to give him a guest one like you could have just had him been an intern the whole time but you know having that little extra twist to to give that that little bit more nuance um you do that kind of stuff a lot and i really enjoy it um it just adds yeah. a great uh, sort of color and depth to everything thank uh, you so well well done um what kind of oh i think i might have skipped did i skip one nope uh what kind of scientific research do you do for your <laughs> <laughs> this this is the question i dread um, once well, I decided, you know, you, you've given yourself a little bit of an out when you mentioned it was originally going to be fantasy because I think that you know it has that fantastical element that you can't necessarily yeah. say is coming from any kind of research, I suppose. But yeah, um, I, but but I did when, even when I was doing the fantasy, I really wanted to model things off of the threads and 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 make them in like some kind of quantum strings. Um, of course, yeah. so I, I ended up doing. I, I, I've got. You can't see it in the, in the camera here, but I've got uh, uh, books and books on books on quantum theory and string theory and all that stuff. And and I read them and I studied them and I, I realized that I'm really not smart enough to understand what the hell that's all about. So, <laughs> But, you know, honestly, yeah. even if you even if you were in that scenario, um, I, I'm, I'm sort of I enjoyed that. I guess I guess I enjoyed that it didn't get like marred down in a lot of technical jargon yeah, and things like that it's it, definitely it, occasionally it's needed but it's it's um it's just the right amount i think it keeps it very accessible yeah. and 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 moving along at a good pace um all right what's oh this is an interesting question what scene in the book or part of the book brought you the most joy and which one the most struggle this is potentially a tough one with um mm. with spoilers being a concern i guess um well i i can i can tell you right off the top of my head which one um there's actually two scenes that, that give me the greatest joy. One is the opening. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, I actually had a completely different opening through every iteration of the book, except for the final one. And then I woke up one morning and I said, this is what it needs to be. And I wrote it and I handed that in as the final product to Sheila. And, uh, and I think it's, it's one of the best scenes in the book. I, I really it's love great. it. It's great. Yeah. And, and the contrast the other between one, it and then what immediately follows is awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. Which I just thought that was awesome. Yeah, keep yeah. going, keep going. The other one that I that I really enjoyed writing is at one point there's there uh, Darwin is escaping from a group of people and he needs to hide, and he hides underneath a bridge, and describing um, the process of of how he uses the threads to help him hide and how it changes him and how it affects him. That yeah, yeah. was another one of my favorite scenes. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. As for the toughest ones to write, oh, every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any specific um, types of scenes that you generally, like I find writing action scenes are just a breeze almost. I, I don't even really, I lose track of time. I'll write thousands of words in an hour or two. Uh, yeah, and then there's yeah. there's other scenes that just, you know, 300 words after four or five hours at it. And I'm just like, ah, make it yeah. end. Um, action scenes work for, work for me fairly, fairly really quickly. And yeah. um, scenes with a lot of dialogue, I, I, I seem to be able to get those out um, yep. relatively quickly as well. Uh, the scenes I struggle with are, 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 you know, what I call the transition scenes, where they're they've got I've got to get them from A to B, but I can't just poof you're magically there. 
all yeah, the yeah. time. Right. Yeah. So I've, I've got to, I've got to move them along. And it, you know, if, if you actually write it out, you're, you're two or three scenes of, Oh my gosh, am I reading Lord of the Rings or what? <laughs> you know, it's, it, it just slows right down. Just, so you, you've got it. You got to tighten those up and shorten them and, and put some, some more tension to them. And, and yeah, those yeah, ones yeah. are the ones I struggle with. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Um, uh, okay, let's see. Apparently, some super famous authors have a team of writers on each book, i.e. each writer writes one chapter based on the famous writer's theme for the book. Um, thoughts on that approach once you get more famous? Assembly line <laughs> writing? <laughs> um, I'm envisioning threader books with your name in huge letters, and then and then at the bottom it says, uh, written by Jason Huff or something like that. <laughs> yeah. You see this with, like, Robert... <laughs> The board, whatever, and then it's got some guys. I always feel bad for the person at the bottom because I'm like, they, you know, they did all the work. Yeah, uh, I, I can't see myself ever actually ending up in that situation. I don't think it. Uh, it, <laughs> it, it would take a, a a minor miracle for me to get quite that that big as a writer. Uh, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll probably, if I ever get to be a really huge writer, I'll probably end up going the George R. R. Martin route and just promising a book for years and years and years. <laughs> and then, <laughs> no, yeah, it's an interesting I, it's, scenario. It's, I always try to imagine, like, you know, that there, there would be so much appetite for something that I'd written that the publisher wants way more of it than you can actually provide. Um, yeah. To make that mental leap to go, well, let's get someone else to write it, but still put my name in huge letters. I just don't know. I don't see the, I don't know. I, I, it's not, yeah, I don't, no, I don't think I could do but that. But no. a good problem to have, I assume. Um, as, well, yeah, as, it, you know, buys a nice big house and a pool, and you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't. Wow. <laughs> All right, so okay, this is a good one. Uh, what draws you to being a writer? What what drew you originally to being a writer? Originally, wow. I mean, how far back do we want to go? <laughs> I actually have a, a notebook here that I think I wrote in grade six that uh, that has a fantasy novel in it. Well, a novel. I think I managed a hundred pages of handwritten text before I decided that I, this wasn't cut out for me. Um, it, it was just something that I've always wanted to do really. Okay. Um, um, and that, you know, from, from an early age until I guess about grade 10, I was introduced to my first computer. Um, yep. for those, th those are th no computers. It would have been a Commodore pet. So that's okay. Old. Yeah. It's <laughs> yep. really old. Uh, in, in high school, we were still using punch cards to do COBOL programming in, in computer class. So <laughs> that was old. But uh, I, I got hooked on computers and uh, and decided that was probably a positive career move. And it, it, it did turn out to be a positive career move. That's my, yeah. my entire career has been around computers. Um, but I always always wanted to write and I always tinkered. I, you know, I'd see a book on how to plot on the shelf and, and I'd buy it and I'd put it and I'd read it and I'd put it on my shelf. And then when I turned 40, I said, enough, enough, enough. I've had a great career as a computer programmer. I'm not going to quit because we all know how writing pays. Um, so I'm not going to do that. But I've got to write. This is, this is, I've got to do it. And I gave myself 10 years to be published. Yeah, nice. Um, and um, uh, Sheila bought um, The Courier at uh, 10 years and two months. Oh, awesome. So it worked out pretty well. Yeah. Now, now was National Novel Writing Month like the first time you had really given it a serious stab? No, no. Okay. No, d d definitely not. I because I um, no, I've got a, d a bunch of stuff that that I'm burning that will never see the light of day. That, um, <laughs> that, 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 that were a lot of practice novels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before that. Yeah, yeah. Now, what about? Um, in that sort of intervening period from when you were in uh, grade school to when you decided I have to write, um, were, were there other creative endeavors that you embarked upon to see if they were your thing or did you just always know that, writing was the one you wanted to? Well, that, that's an interesting question um, uh, because I started my career as a computer programmer. Um, yeah. and Which I've in many ways. IT. Yeah. Yeah. I, I only moved into it recently, but um, um uh, when I was writing, which one would it have been? It was probably, um, I think it was the operative. Um, okay. uh, work got really, really hectic. And I was coding and I was coding. And I got home and I couldn't write. And I realized that programming, for me, computer programming and writing draw from the same well. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I, just, it, I, I, I could do one very well and the other badly or not at all. And I, I just couldn't find a balance. Uh, and that's when I moved, I actually moved to working three days a week instead of five. Uh, I'm back up to four now because of the whole COVID thing. But, uh, and mm. uh, I got out of programming and moved into managing the IT department. And uh, oh, that, okay. that, that, is, that is completely different. So I, it, it yeah, uh, yeah, doesn't yeah. draw from me well. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I, I think that was it. It was just um, the, the computer programming was, was the outlet that I used. Very interesting. All right, so let's see here. Other than uh, a science fiction author, <coughs> do you write for a specific type of reader? Um, and as such, uh, how much do you take into account the reader's perspective in your work? Well, that's that's a good one. Um, you know, not to sound rude, um, but I don't. Um, I, I, I write a novel that I would want to read. I, I have to write for myself. If I try to write for somebody else, then I'm not sure that it's my voice that's going to be coming through. Yeah, and I have to write something that that I enjoy, that I would enjoy reading, that I would uh, that I would buy if I saw it on the shelf. Yeah. Now, and the uh, interesting thing to that is, um, I always considered myself a fantasy writer, and I have never sold anything but science fiction. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I absolutely know what you're saying. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I. I do, do you read, so obviously you read fantasy, but do you read in other genres than science fiction? And, and um, uh, I love thrillers. Um, same. So I read, I read a lot of thrillers, and I think you can see that in the uh, San Angeles series. Absolutely. Um, I, th I think it blends the two together fairly well. Mm -hmm. um, fantasy, science fiction. Um, other than that, no, but I, I was recommended this book, so I bought this one, and I'm not 100% sure what it is yet. But it was so highly recommended, I bought it sight unseen, and it's next on my list to read. I love um, reading something sight unseen. That's my favorite yeah. thing. <laughs> um, I do something really weird. People always get uh, are surprised by this. For, but uh, it's almost a, a cure for writer's block for me. I will go um, to a movie theater, not lately, obviously, but <laughs> in years yeah. past. Um, and I'll just get a ticket for whatever is starting next. I don't even ask what the movie is or anything. I love going in, oh, I've wow. never seen a trailer for this, don't know what genre it is, I don't even know who's in it, I just sit down and see a movie. Um, and it's usually something I do when I'm kind of stuck writing, because no matter what the movie is, there will always be something in it, a little turn of phrase or a, you know, a, a detail in the background or something that'll just spark an idea for me that I can, that I can roll with later. Yeah. But it's, there's something really that's, great that's, about Sight Unseen. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, that's awesome. I think I'm going to try to do that next time when, when COVID lifts and uh, it's fun. Feel yeah. Brave enough it's, to go into the world again. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Especially now where you'll just take anything, just anything that gets me out of the house. I'll take <laughs> That's it. Right. It doesn't seem like that weird anymore. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. It's right. Reader's perspective is a, an interesting thing. I, I, Sarah often tells me, well, she told me, pointedly i think when um after my first book was done and and i'd started working on my second book and i i kind of tentatively i'm like so do i send this to you first and and you know and she's like she's all the only reader that matters to you now is your editor <laughs> just <laughs> if you make them happy then they'll make sure that everyone else is happy that's their job so all you have to focus on is pleasing your editor um yeah so from a reader's and perspective that's, that's the one that's the same it, I, I sent it to my editor before I sent it to, uh, I mean, Sarah and I obviously talked about it and stuff, but uh, sure. I'm pretty sure Sheila had a copy before Sarah did. Yeah. 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 yeah that's good. Um, well, okay. I think we're through the questions that are there at the moment. It's 745. So I don't know if you want to add anything before see if anyone else has any last minute questions or mysterious galaxy has anything to say. Uh, I don't th just want to add that I hope you enjoy the book. It, uh, I enjoyed writing it. I think it's one of the best things I've written so far. Uh, it's even better than book two, but that's because book two is not finished yet. It still needs another pass or two. <laughs> but I hope, I hope those that read it enjoy it. Awesome. Well, I certainly did. And I'm, I'm glad to hear there's two more coming. Wait, I know. I'm excited for another trilogy. I feel like duologies have had a hot moment, so I get really excited now when I'm hearing that we're getting three books, because two just isn't enough for me. I'm a greedy reader, so I'm glad we have two more on the way. And I want to thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you, Jason, and thank sure. you, Gerald, sure. and for celebrating your thank birthday you. with us. It is a very special day indeed. 
and thank you to all of our readers you guys were absolutely amazing in the comments thank you for all of the book love if you would like to purchase the author's books or get book plates with said book there's going to be the buy button there for you and thank you so so very much to everyone and we will see you next time have a good evening everybody <laughs> all right thanks everyone thank uh, thanks for the chat gerald it was great, gerald was great. <laughs> thank congratulations you. again thank on the lunch, again on the lunch. <laughs> thanks bye-bye <laughs>